A very warm welcome to all the students, scholars, teachers, and keen listeners. I, Aditi, am delighted to welcome you all to the 23rd monthly lecture of our online guest lecture series organized by the scholars of the School of Sanskrit Philosophy and Indic Studies. Today we have with us the esteemed name in the philosophy, field of philosophy from Northeastern Hill University, Shillong, Professor Prasenjit Biswas, who will deliver an interestingly titled talk, The Smartphone Act Like a Rosary. Kindly note that the entire event along with the contents in the talk chat box are being recorded. I request all the participants to follow the digital protocols and keep the microphones on mute throughout the lecture. There will be a question and answer session after the lecture where we can discuss and ask the questions. Now I request Dipanki for a welcome address. Over to you, Dipanki. Thank you. Thank you, Aditi. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Hello. Yes, you. Good afternoon, everyone, distinguished chief guest, respected professor Kosi Tharakan, and all other faculty and research scholar from Goa University and from the outside of this university. On the behalf of Sanskrit philosophy and Indic studies, I would like to take this opportunity to welcome our guest lecturer, Dr. Prasenjit Biswas. Dr. Uh, professor Prasenjit Biswas is a professor of philosophy at Northeastern Hill University, Silom, since 2011. His specialization include phenomenology and continental philosophy, philosophy of science, philosophy of Northeast India, Indian commun communities and tribes, contemporary Indian philosophy and consciousness. He is also an independent political analyst and commentator. He taught philosophy IIT in IIT Dharwar, IIT Bombay, IIT Guwahati uh, in Assam University also. He um, has been He has been visiting fellow at Cambridge University, PISS Mumbai, JNU, Rabindra Bharati University, Paderborn University, and University of Tartu. A widely read and travel scholar, he looks after the newly created Office of International Affairs at Nehu, Silom. He is a recipient of Kist Leon Residential Scholarship at Wing State University, USA, and received doctoral Jawaharlal Nehru Memorial Scholarship of Government of India. Thank you. Over to you, Aditi. Now I invite Professor Biswas for the lecture. Over to you, sir. OK. Uh, good um, afternoon. And we are at the twilight you know, in certain parts of India. Uh, so good afternoon to all of you. And uh, uh, this is a kind of a lecture that uh, I wanted to um, deliver on uh, the broad area of uh, philosophy of technology. Uh, but uh, technology and philosophy of technology are uh, two different things, you know. And that is what I want to reflect on more. And I want to take you uh, through a detour of uh, uh, Bul Chung Han, you know. Uh, Bung Chul Han uh, is a Korean German philosopher who had substantially written on technology. And just uh, some of my students are working on Bull at this moment. You know, he resembles Northeastern people, so some people take interest in him. And then, you know, the larger critical issues that Han throws on us, throws on us, can be addressed better if we look at some of these contemporary philosophers like Simon Robel, you know, Simon Robel, uh, who is a Polish philosopher, but based in America. And the other philosopher whom I have thought about uh, in a little theological way, theological way, is uh, Maggie Savin, uh, uh, is Maggie Savin Baden, is her full name, you know. And she is uh, kind of a comparatively younger philosopher who has uh, edited uh, many works. And some of these works we will look at, you know, her work, especially on uh, post-digital theology, as she as she calls it, you know. Uh, so uh, so we'll um, sort of take a detour, you know, through Bung Chul Han, 
uh, we'll go to uh, Bung Chul Han's uh, notion of um, the psychopolitical and the biopolitical, you know, and various other works or works of Bung Chul Han. And uh, then that will connect us to something called the post digital, you know, life of the self and uh, how that kind of self is uh, sort of constituted uh, in terms of uh, a certain uh, continuation, a continuation which is entirely virtual and uh, not um, in terms of uh, something that is conceivably what we call as real. Uh, so, so you have this virtual continuation of digital life, you know, which uh, constitutes the self in a certain way and which uh, also gives certain capabilities to the uh, digital self or to the post-digital self uh, that uh, Simon, you know, so wonderfully talks about in various places. And then we will look at the implications of this kind of a post-digital understanding of uh, the notion of self and also uh, post-digital technologies that uh, fall back on, you know, something that is natural, something that is biological. And at the same time, uh, it is able to produce uh, something like uh, a new meaning of technology to our human lives. So, so human becomes once again at the center of uh, post-digital self and post-digital technology. And there is a kind of a technological evolutionary progression, you know, uh, because all inventions that happens during the uh, post-digital times uh, is something that is less integrative, you know, and something that uh, uh, enhances uh, our capacity to cognitively connect uh, to certain technological processes. But this cognitive connection that we have with the technological processes uh, requires us to rewrite to rewrite or re-understand or re-territorialize, you know, that's a better word from uh, Bull, um, uh, Bull, Bung Chul Han's um, vocabulary that allows us a re-territorialization of technology. So, so we'll go through uh, various fragments. Uh, it's a kind of a huge corpus of work. Uh, just to begin with, you know, uh, let's begin with an idea of technology. What is this idea of technology that we are trying to uh, bring here? Uh, the idea of technology is that uh, technology is uh, most often, you know, considered as a kind of an extended self. It's a kind of an extension of the self. And an extension is of such a kind that uh, new forms of enactments, new forms of embodiments are possible. So uh, I am using a simple speaker and the speaker is uh, now part of my body. And through the speaker, I'm able to enact philosophical arguments that uh, Bung Chul Han has produced in some of his works. And of course, I'm going to produce a critique of all these arguments. Uh, this would not have been possible had I not augmented myself to speak to all of you through this simple speaker and by connecting myself to a wider digital platform, which is provided by Internet of Things. You know. Uh, and then the sounds that I'm producing here are getting transmitted uh, by an entire process of transduction, as we call it. It's a kind of a transduction, you know. The sound that is going from my vocal cord is getting into another duct. And these ducts are electronic ducts. Electronic ducts are converting my sounds into uh, certain kinds of bits and bytes. You know, bits and bytes, which are uh, in terms of uh, certain pulses. And these pulses are calculated in terms of binary numbers, numbers that give you a certain bit of information. If my sound is very long, then it will give you, let's say, one bit or two bit of information. Or if I continue to add uh, many more sounds and sound patterns, that's going to give you a pattern of information in terms of uh, an elongated bit, an extended bit, which can be later converted into a unit of byte, BYT as well. So, so this is how, you know, the piecemeal uh, sounds, the piecemeal cognitive uh, elements, uh, which are more fundamental, 
uh, then the material elements at this moment you know are put to a variety of ducts a variety of channels and they are transducted into certain kinds of digits certain kinds of numbers or certain kind of symbols that are put together and after being put together they produce an idea they produce an effect with an a of transmission of those sounds and these ideas across these multiple ducts so so what is happening here you know is an entirely different process of production a process of production that starts with something material and translates itself into something virtual something completely immaterial at the other end for a an user and then the user is also further enabled to turn this immaterial products into something beneficial something that is material something that will enhance that which was available as an original so a re-enhancement of the original product by using multiple ducts multiple channels of communication and multiple ways of translating it into something immaterial that can be retranslated reinscribed into certain other kinds of challenge channels of use which will turn it into something material and something beneficial so it's a very different you know way of producing an idea and and circulating it transmitting it or communicating it and this is what the digital life uh, brings to us at this point of time uh, but then uh, this kind of a digitization you know that also requires uh, an understanding of what this digitization is all about uh, it's uh, something uh, that is symbolic you know in terms of artificial intelligence we think about uh, manipulation of these symbols and manipulation of these symbols that results into uh, a hierarchy of symbols a hierarchy uh, that connects us to the world you know as a whole in a, in a different world in, in a different way than the usual way in which or the conventional way in which we are connected uh, so so a kind of manipulation of symbols a kind of maneuvering you know uh, uh, of these manipulated symbols and then uh, reweaving those manipulated symbols uh, in our in our you know tact of maneuvering in our pathways of maneuvering uh, in order to uh, create uh, a different idea of the world uh, at the level of the individual uh, at the micro level and then you know at a larger level which is macro where uh, individuals are able to throw up uh, the the ideas that they have construed out of this process and all these ideas can come together uh, in order to produce once again uh, a domain of new ideas uh, and that will enhance once again something more uh, that will create something more that will enhance that will uh, multiply that will pluralize uh, and that will create an entirely new set of uh, products you know now this is uh, this is a process that uh, that's technologically manipulated and technologically created now this technologically manipulated process or technologically created process you know uh, is something uh, that uh, perplexes us very much it perplexes us in the sense that what is its impact on us uh, the impact of a product which has come from almost nowhere uh, but which has come through a process a process that is so well designed and that is so artificially uh, intelligent kind of a process uh, which has created out of this manipulation you know which uh, goes by a variety of names at this point of time some of these names uh, let me just uh, spell it out uh, let's say a name like uh, something that we call as generative ai at this point of time uh, generative ai that is able to create uh, a new kind of uh, ai out of um, uh, the kind of intelligence that you have already put into use what you have put into use you know uh, that is a kind of a network of symbols let's let's call it network of manipulated symbols and from these networks of manipulated symbols the machine is able to identify certain patterns you know let's say these are patterns of talking 
or patterns of using certain communities or uh, certain cultural patterns of having certain kinds of beliefs, certain kind of choices or preferences. So when we identify these networks into patterns, you know, then we are able to concretely identify something that is connected to the larger social behavior, larger human behavior in terms of cultural creeds, choices, fashions, preferences, you know. Uh, so so this, is, this is collected, in a sense, out of the network of symbols. And this collection out of the network of symbols, you know, uh, actually converts the existing data into generating something new and something more original than the original, you know. And, and this is something that uh, actually makes it generative. And we call it generative because uh, we do not want to, uh, we, we do not want to turn it into uh, uh, something that uh, is not intelligent, uh, but something that is uh, uh, not exactly supervised by us, but something that generates sua motto by itself. If we're able to have a network of symbols on which you are doing some computation, on which you are doing some manipulative process, you know, if you have that kind of a network, then that network, whether it is supervised or not supervised, you know, that uh, gives us uh, some kind of models, that gives us uh, maybe uh, some kind of toy models, you know, let, uh, to begin with, you know, in order to uh, produce uh, something like uh, something like a prototype, you know, of what one wants to produce, or uh, it may really give us uh, something that is more baffling, you know, it can give us, let's say, it can reconstruct a Neolithic tool for us, or it can actually introduce an entirely different and a very fast computing software, you know, let's say, in our computer in which I'm speaking, you know. So generative AI actually creates a, a lot of such possibilities. And, and there's a way to uh, uh, sort of evaluate to what extent uh, this kind of generative AI is actually helpful, you know. Uh, there are these uh, uh, variational kind of generative AI generative AI that varies across networks, you know. Uh, they are not same across all networks. The way you have generated, let's say, a generative AI in this network in which I'm speaking, let's say, whatever I'm speaking is getting translated into French immediately because of a generative AI program. Uh, or, you know, let's say I'm speaking in my mother tongue and that is coming to your ears as if I'm speaking in English you know, because of a generative AI that I have fitted, you know, and adjusted to my way of speaking that will turn my language into English immediately in a correct way. And then further, in the same network, it can be translated into French and it goes to you. So that's one way of generative AI. Uh, the other way could be the moment I speak, the generative AI could be that uh, at your end, you have fitted uh, an AI program that turns all that I say into a written script, into a written text. And maybe that text is in Malayalam or maybe in one of the Indian languages that you speak, you know. So this generative AI is something that is variational, you know. It's not something that is, sta that, that is static. And this variational a generative AI, you know, has a certain kind of an encoder, you know. It is encoded at my end as well as at your end. And these encoders make it possible to turn it into something different, to put it to use other than what is intended uh, by one who is producing it. And therefore, it's possible to create uh, multiple copies, uh, enhanced copies, which are you know, much more stimulating. And these multiple AI copies of my lecture, you know, can generate something that is more simulable. It can even uh, create a kind of a machine that actually represents uh, the, the, the kind of thinking that is going on in me, 
that I start with symbol and end up in something virtual and immaterial to be further translated into something beneficial and material. So there's a certain translational process in my very thinking. And that can be captured by the machine and the machine can further actually show it before you through a generative AI program, you know. Uh, now this uh, generative AI program uh, actually can also create a certain kind of a division in the network. And this division could be uh, a generator, you know, that generates kind of new products and new examples. And a discriminator, which is very, very important, a discriminator that learns to distinguish generated content, generated content as either real, you know, from the domain or something that is altered. It may be even fake, you know. So you can have within this generative AI, you know, uh, a kind of, uh, uh, a kind of a uh, model, you know, a kind of a model in which one neural network is pitted against another neural network. And this is what we call as adversarial artificial intelligence. From generative artificial intelligence, we move towards an adversarial artificial intelligence. As we move towards an adversarial artificial intelligence, which can separate and distinguish between what is generated by an AI and a discriminator, you know, which can identify what is real in what has been generated or what is altered in what has been generated or what has been sort of faked, you know, by what has been generated from the original uh, neural network, which is a generative neural network, you know. So, so, so you can see here what is happening, you know, uh, Bull Chung Han, you know, will say that this kind of a uh, splitting of a generative AI into adversarial AI by creating a generator and a discriminator, you know, is an enactment of symbolic manipulation. And this entire kind of a distinction, this kind of creation of an adversarial neural network out of one neural network, which is the original neural network, you know, is an act of splitting the very neural network. It's an act of creating a kind of a disruption, a kind of a disruptive move within the available uh, network of generative AI, you know. And this disruptive move, actually, you know, uh, is a kind of uh, is a kind of, once again, is a, is a new kind of encoding. The existing encoder, you know, is changed into a new encoder. So that symbols that are encoded in the original network, you know, now finds the new encoder and they produce something that is encoded as totally new. And that which is encoded as totally new, whether that is generated from the content that was given by the generative AI, or that is something which is altered, faked, mixed up, adulterated or not, that a discriminator a neural network can exactly identify where all these kind of changes have happened and how this has produced a different kind of a neural network altogether. Uh, now, you see, there's this possibility of generative artificial intelligence and uh, adversarial artificial intelligence coming together in a kind of a contestation and that kind of a contestation you know uh, could be now uh, negotiated you know it could be negotiated through another larger network uh, and and that kind of a larger network you know requ will require will require at various stages you know multiple transformer blocks you know which are known as layers so you can have a layered hierarchical, as I was talking about, a layered hierarchical manipulated set of symbols. And if it is layered, that it moves from layer one to the layer two. At layer one, you have a concept. Let's say at layer one, you have a concept of moment uh, constituting your sense of time. At layer two, 
you have a sense of what is past or what is present or what is future. At layer three, you know, you dissolve these distinctions that your sense of time had created at the first layer of manipulated symbols by encoding it as a kind of a concept which undergoes a change at layer two and then further at layer three and then further at layer four. So if you have this multiple transforming layers or transformers or transforming encoders, uh, as it is called in a technical language, you know, Bull uh, Han, you know, Bull Chung Han would call it uh, a process of auto transformation, a process of auto transformation, which uh, we give unto ourselves. We give it to ourselves so that whatever ideas we have produced, you know, do not remain as an original set of ideas. And we allow these ideas to be transmuted into something that is more usable, something that is more desirable, you know, something that is more, uh, uh, in a sense, which creates a new sense of self or which uh, creates a new kind of attachment, you know. Uh, so, so, so these manipulation of symbols, you know, go with, a certain kind of a psycho, uh, a, a certain kind of a psychological uh, change of uh, our uh, ways of receiving them, uh, because we are at the receiving end. Whatever manipulation of symbols we are doing, we are not doing it without uh, receiving them. Whether we have pre-thought about uh, what is going to happen to them, or uh, we allow them to, uh, we allow them to emerge into whatever is going to happen without pre-thinking, without controlling them, you know, is also our choice. Certain uh, network symbols, certain neural networks can be controlled by using adversarial neural networks, which can work on any generative neural network, and thereby it can create a kind of, uh, a different kind of an agency, you know, through the network itself. Uh, and these agencies we may not prefer all the time. And this is something uh, that we need to uh, talk about a little more. How we prefer a different kind of a network, you know, is there an obsession you know, for creating a different kind of a network? A network between, let's say, AI and humans. A network between AI and other non-humans. A network between AI and an ecosystem. Because you can have all kinds of networks. So opening up the possibilities of new kinds of network is something that generative AI creates. And this is something that uh, uh, Bull uh, Chung Han, you know, uh, would like to connect to the current uh, uh, state of technological uh, development, you know, uh, which is, uh, uh, which is uh, very, very important. And the current state of technological development is something that uh, we all are uh, trying to understand. And what we are trying to understand is that uh, whether uh, the, the new kinds of technological changes, you know, uh, is creating a new kind of activity or hyperactivity, you know, whether it is creating new kinds of boundaries, whether it is creating a distinguishable kind of impact on our mental health, uh, so that there is a certain kind of a uh, borderline uh, kind of a, uh, if I may use uh, Bull's word, a borderline kind of a disorder, you know, that is happening through this kind of a technological cha change. Because all the time, as that famous advertisement was saying, Dil mange more, that we desire more and more, more and more out of, out of what? Out of this generative AI, as if generative AI is now capable of, you know, uh, moving faster than what we desire. If we desire to have a kind of an avatar, an electronic avatar of myself in a certain network, you know, maybe in the Facebook, I want an avatar of myself, an avatar, you know, who continually thinks philosophically and who desires to transform the existing set of philosophical concepts uh, into something that is deconstructive, something that is non-conceptual, you know, and something that creates a new kind of deliberation in my new electronic avatar, you know, and that is possible. 
on a certain on a certain network by using generative AI, but whether that kind of a possibility opens up as Bung Chul Han would call it, a kind of a borderline personality disorder, or it creates a kind of a boundary between my alter self and the real self, if I have a real self, is <coughs> a kind of question that arises from this kind of technological changes, whether it creates a new sense of achievement, you know, and that's where Bull uh, contributes quite a lot, you know, uh, Bull Chung Han contributes and say that we are continually moving towards a society of achievements, uh, which all the time tries to surplus the current level of achievement and moves towards a new level of achievement. What is that new level of achievement that we are thinking of? The new level of achievement is not in terms of merely earning, augmenting or enhancing. But the new level of achievement is in terms of sacrificing the old at the altar of the new. You know, there is an act of sacrificing. And uh, that act of sacrificing you know, is not entirely self-driven. It is driven by the generative AI. The generative AI now tries to change everything that we have. The very concept of having or the very concept of being is now altered into you know, a new concept of having. What is that new concept of having? A new concept of having that is not focused on what we have, but that is focused on altering you know, the, the content of what we have. So therefore, it is focused on creating a new object a new domain of objects, which is not entirely desired by us, but it is something driven by desire, but at the same time not desired by us, but we lend up at that and we try to possess it as a new product. You know. now, now you can see here a certain kind of a logic of creating new products as it is involved in the market is operating in our own psyche, which is driven not by the psyche itself, but driven by generative AI in which we are taking part, because we are taking part in symbol manipulation. Uh, now, now think of the larger picture, which is emerging out of it. Are we taking part in a process of changing all that we have, starting with the small little language or the small little possession you know, which is uh, to which I am attached, which I now want to change into something different. You know, uh, it's like uh, not like it's not like just like changing my fashion and making myself more fashionable, uh, but it's also like changing the orientation, the very orientation of my choice, that I choose something a new, a fresh, of which even my desire has never desired it, you know, of which I am not aware or I am not pre-aware, but at the same time I am going to choose it thinking that it is something new. Whether the newness of the new now affects the existing sense of what we think as new or existing uh, mental quality of desire, you know, is the question. And these questions arise at the borderline, you know, at the borderline between what we have and what we are going to have in the process of changing, you know, what that uh, having would be, what the content of that having would be, if I'm able to explain this. Uh, this is a kind of a, a very different kind of a change that is happening at this moment. It's not from a, it's, it's not a change from one set of objects to another set of objects. But it's a change in which the changed, the altered, you know, is not part of what one has desired, you know. But at the same time, as if it is desired and the desire has driven us to that point, you know. And, as, and that requires a kind of theorization. What is the nature of the desire? And here, very briefly, I will, before I uh, get into these philosophers properly, you know, 
uh, Han throws up this question, but uh, Han doesn't answer this question, you know, uh, and uh, uh, because uh, it creates a kind of antagonism, uh, according to Han, between what we have chosen as new, you know, and what our choices lead us to as new, you see. What we have chosen as new and what our choices lead us to as new is a kind of an antagonism. An antagonism that cannot be uh, reduced uh, to a kind of a uh, acceptance, to a kind of a consensus, or to a kind of a compulsion and restraint, or uh, it cannot be even considered as a kind of an external or alien limitation, you know. It's a kind of a subjugation of oneself and one's own desire to something that is going to be, you know, uh, going to be yours or that is not going to be yours equally, you know. So you are subjecting yourself and subjugating yourself into a project of, uh, into a project of something that is new. Something that is not recognizing your limitations and self constraints, and which is taking the form of a certain kind of a compulsive achievement or optimization, you know. And this is what Han has called as agony of the eros. Eros is that Greek word which means desire, which means uh, a certain kind of a solicitation, a certain kind of a seeking, you know. Uh, and Loka, Laka, you know, Zak Laka would call, you know, this is a kind of a absurd object that one is trying to seek. This idea of new is a kind of an absurd object, you know. Uh, it's an uh, it's an object, though petite, you know. It's a kind of an object that we see most of the times uh, from the rear window of our car. And it's not seen from the front window. It's only seen at the rear window. And what is written at the rear window? It's written that objects may be nearer than, 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 than they actually are in the rear window. So, so the idea of change here and the change object, you know, is a certain kind of an imaging. It's a certain kind of a presencing of a new object before our desire. or a, a new altered kind of an object because of our engagement with generative AI, you know, it's not happening uh, entirely in an automate, automated manner, but it is something that is autopiloted out of the desire that you have for the new. Uh, suppose someone doesn't have that kind of a desire for the new, even not having the desire for the new is something absurd at this moment. Because the desire, because you have the desire, so you must have something new. And if you have no desire, that also is an absurdity, you know, it's a kind of a borderline compulsive behavior to have desire and not to have desire and to have a new object through your desire or to stand before uh, a, a new image of a new object, you know, and desire it. As if you really desire it, while you do not desire it. Something like the objects that we see, object petite, uh, object that we desire for, you know, Lanka would say. And as it is seen from the rear window, from the rear window, you can see all the objects uh, on the uh, screen of your car, you know. But these objects are actually nearer than uh, they seem to be, you know. They are not so distant as they seem to be. So, you are nearer. The only feeling that you get is that you are nearer to, to fulfillment and to achievement. But what you are nearer of, you know, that itself is an image, you know, that, that's not really a concrete kind of an object. It's an image to which you are nearer. And being an image to which you are nearer, you know, your desire is sparked off, you know. Your, your desire is now part of a larger process of simulation. That can happen through the generative AI. And simulation, as you know, is like creating prototypes or creating images uh, that would suit a certain capacity to receive, a certain receptive capacity is augmented by the act of simulation, 
by the act of desiring a certain simulation and by standing nearer to that what has been simulated and desired but at the same time it is not something that is concrete which you already have and which is a kind of a opening to the rear view of the window to which you can see objects at the back which are not so distant as they look like but they're nearer they're nearer they are almost or your car is almost reaching near them so your desire is moving through your car and reaching to those rear view objects it's a situation like this and uh bull chung han is right to say that this is agony of the eros agony of desire it is a kind of an agonized desire and this agonized desire goes to the point of loss of desire the disappearance of the ability you know to devote you know any desire for the other the desire for this kind of new and fresh objects creates a loss of desire an inability to desire for the other you know han diagnoses it you know as a kind of a strange situation for oneself that oneself becomes a stranger to oneself and being a stranger to oneself you know one is not able to desire desire the other or desire for the other or desire something for the other what one is desiring is actually losing uh, the very sense of uh, desiring or the very sense of being desired or the very sense of being desirable you know but at the same time desire is simulated through this sense of losing desire to the sense of losing the desirable and to the sense of even losing the desire for the other and and this is something disappearance of the desire very very act of desiring or disappearance of desire itself you know even love and sexuality you know are permeated by uh, this kind of a uh, loss of desire and this loss of desire only can create a simulated sense of love a simulated sense of attachment which is uh, very different from love as human relation or uh, or sexuality as a marker of human relation or, or a kind of enchantment or attachment to the other in the form of love or in the form of a loving relation which is now manipulated into a relationship of desire a relationship that cuts into the very very facet of the relation and turns it into a non relation a kind of a desirable non relationality or a non relationality of desire that is uh, that is without um, uh, the the content of desire uh, that's a kind of a uh, contentless desire which is uh, more desirable than the present state of desire Uh, so this is a kind of a liminal state uh, of uh, encountering two different processes within the same process of desiring desiring leading to you know desiring something more you know which leads to desiring in a sense a simulated object and one perpetually stands before that simulated object without attaining it so the achievement society or the aspiring society creates a certain kind of a gap a certain kind of a black hole between the desire or the act of desiring and what is desirable or what is projected as one's desire now agony of the eros is also for bull chung han you know is an agony of thought and this agony of thought you know is something that uh, uh, that is um, that is not entirely Opti- that is not entirely pessimistic for you know uh, Bung Bung Chul you know Bung Chul doesn't consider it pessimistic this agony of thought this agony of thought you know as he tries to call it you know uh, not everything must be understood and liked you know that is agony of thought not everything must be made available so what is made available you know is something that is simulated. something that is created by the generative ai so technology here is driving one you know to a kind of a abundance of 
to a kind of an abundance of desire, to a kind of a surplus of what one desires, you know. So finally, you can see here, uh, Bull Chung Han will point to the logic of the market. The logic of the market is to expand the desire and expand the basket of products in a manner that whether you are attached or you are detached, still you will stand before them as if you have a desire for all of them, as if, as if you stand before uh, a kind of a showcase, as if you stand before a counter in McDonald's and you look at the menu which is hung before you uh, like a computer screen, you know, and you sort of read all this menu and you understand it or you don't understand it. Uh, whether they are available or not available is not the question. But the question is that you have stood before a large uh, eatery where you have these menus, you have these prices, uh, which actually create a kind of external constraint in your choice, or it induces you into choosing something out of this, you know, out of these uh, too many things that you have on the menu, you know. Uh, whether you desire or you don't desire, if you are before, uh, you are given with a menu as you are given with uh, when you go to a restaurant or you go to uh, a large eatery and you see the prices and you look at the uh, kind of culinary uh, delicacies, you know, uh, and then you choose or you do not choose. But at the same time, you know, you are in the presence of you know, a set of altered objects, a, a set of altered menu of objects, you know, from which whether you choose or not choose, but your desire, the function of desire, you know, is satisfied by being present before that kind of a menu, by being present uh, before a large screen where all these menu are enlisted with their prices. So, so what is happening here? Bull, Chung Han says what is happening here is a transformation of the being, you know, as I started by saying that technology is an extension of that being. It's a kind of an extended form of being, you know, but, but then that extended form of being, you know, is it a kind of a being in the world where you have a sense of agency, you know, where you have a certain grammar of choice, you know, or whether that kind of an extended being, you know, is just a kind of a protrusion, it's just is a kind of a projection, is a kind of a protrusion, which is protruded, protruded out of you, you know, as a desiring subject. Uh, there is a protrusion of that desire uh, in a space which is facing, you know, a set of objects which you haven't originally desired but which is available as a kind of a presence uh, or as a kind of a co-presence along with you, these objects are also available. And between you, the function of desire is satisfied because you are present before those objects. Now, this is the agony of thinking how, you know, you have liked or you haven't liked, whether you have found them available or you have not found them available. Now, this is something uh, that uh, Buyung Chul Han talks about in his famous book called The Burnout Society. You know, the burnout society focuses on uh, a certain kind of a violence, you know, that an extended being of an individual, uh, the extended being of an individual before a showcase, the extended being of an individual satisfying the function of desiring, you know. The extended being of an individual uh, trying to look at a number of things, you know, uh, that is the extended being. So, extended being of an individual, you know, is subjecting the being, you know, from which this extension is happening into a kind of violence, a violence which is, you know, done by oneself on oneself by being simply presented before the world, you know, which uh, none of them, Heidegger even couldn't talk, uh, talk about or think about. It is an unthinkable situation of violence. Unthinkable because it's not self-inflicted, but it is inflicted by an extended being, you know, 
an extended being that serves a certain function, a certain function which is a kind of a filling function, a kind of a function of sense, a kind of a function of desire, a function of eros, or a function of thinking, you know. And that makes the original human being, you know, either scampa or either have a sense of being disoriented with a kind of being a stranger to oneself or a certain eerie feeling of a certain kind of a strangeness in oneself that one is strangely present before you know a set of things which one hasn't chosen uh, but but it is something that is part of a function of desire part of a larger simulated process of marketing you know of which one is present you know and then the original being of oneself here you know is repressed uh, by the extended being and that's a kind of a violence which is not inflicted by oneself but at the same time it is inflicted upon oneself by an extended part of oneself you know an extended part of oneself which one doesn't necessarily own you are not owning that extended part of yourself but at the same time that extended part of yourself is is performing a certain kind of a physical and mental operation on you so much so that you know you start feeling strange you start feeling giddy you have an eerie feeling or you have a feeling of a certain kind of an enticing desire a certain kind of enchant enchantment a certain swing of your mood you know from uh, from not having much interest to something in which you have suddenly become very interested you know uh, there is a kind of a projection of your being emptying out of your being into uh, the desiring function of the extended being i would say the extended being is functioning uh, for uh, desire and this desiring function of the extended being is emptying out uh, the, the basic sense, the original sense with which, you know, your being got extended, you know, into the simulated virtual world, onto a platform, maybe a, maybe a Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or whatever, you know, wherever you can go and uh, see those images before which you are standing, or wherever you can go and being propelled into a kind of a discussion which you uh, never desired to start but you are getting involved and getting started with that kind kicked off into a uh, kicked up or kicked off into that kind of a desire uh, into a into a kind of a desire for a discourse which is emanating for the discourse and not from you but you are becoming part of the uh, sort of embedded desire of that discourse and connecting yourself to that discourse as we do in the uh, social media that we respond to a variety of statements you know by putting up our own statements you know as if we are like either a generative ai we are either like generative ai or we are either like adversarial artificial intelligence ai which will generate and discriminate you know and will decide which one is good and which one is bad so, so our entire moral sense of what is good and what is evil you know, is now translated into something that generative AI does for us because we are continually in touch with a world which is filled with all kinds of virtual platforms from which we can't dissociate ourselves because if we dissociate ourselves that will be a certain kind of a strangeness because you will become a stranger in this virtual world if you dissociate yourself from that virtual world by associating yourself you get another sense of being a stranger as you are confronting a strange situation and hitherto unknown set of objects of which you have no prior knowledge so dissociating yourself would leave you to yourself as a stranger you become a stranger to yourself associating yourself to that virtual world would make you a stranger to that virtual world and make the virtual world also a stranger to you at the same time. <coughs> so this is a kind of a borderline disorder that is happening, being caught into this large network of virtual world or 
plural virtual worlds at the same time, which is often named as a kind of a metaverse or a pluriverse as well. You know, uh, this is something a kind of a pluriversal sense of being. And this pluriversality of the sense of being, you know, is something which is like this extended being, an extended being that is committing violence on the being with which one enters into this world, you know. And Heidegger couldn't conceive of this entire process, but suffice it to say that Heidegger, in his being of being and time, had pointed out, you know, being ready to hand, you know, as all technologies are, all technologies are ready to hand, you know. It hands out something. All technologies hand out something. Generative AI hands out a new set of symbols. Though this is not part of, you know, what your hand has held so far, it's something that your hand is extended to, you know, as Heidegger would say. And that is being ready to hand. And being ready to hand, Heidegger would say, you know, is to lose your worldhood as if you are not part of this world and you are being transported into a different world, you know, where you have lost your worldhood, Heidegger would say, in being in time. The virtual reality, you know, this shocking manipulated realm of symbols, uh, the symbols that generative AI and, and uh, virtual AI and adversarial AI has created for you, you know, is a, a domain of disruptive technology. And this disruptive technology is turning you into something, uh, something like a very new subject who is partly desubjectivated who is emptied out, but at the same time, in an embodied manner, has remained as a subject, has remained as a kind of a remainder, whatever remains of the desubjectivated subject, who is placed, you know, in this autopiloted mode, in the network of the virtual symbols, you know. Uh, and and uh, it appears now, you know, in a more subtle manner, as a kind of a strange being, and therefore uh, it, it commits a certain kind of a violence on oneself. And this is what uh, uh, Bull, uh, Bull Chung Han discusses in his famous book on typology of violence. This is a certain kind of a typology of violence. The other kind of typology of violence, which is more material, you know, uh, is something in which one tries to one tries to see another, you know, committing violence on herself. One, one tries to see how another is committing violence on herself. And this process of another committing violence on herself, you know, is, is not just losing herself, but it is also pitting herself into an embedded world of new surroundings or new objects, how another, another person or another in a more generalized sense, you know, uh, is pitting herself into a new embedded world. You know, if you can observe that, you know, that itself is like observing how another is committing the kind of violence that I have discussed. Uh, how oneself becomes a stranger to oneself in the same way another is becoming stranger to uh, herself, you know, in a newly embedded world, uh, in a newly embedded world of simulated objects, let's say, you know. Uh, so let's say one has gone to uh, an airport, you know, let me give you an example that comes to my mind, and one is standing in the uh, gallery of the visitors uh, who uh, like to see that the that the plane that is carrying off their uh, near and dear flies off, you know, from the visitor's gallery. They want to see that, you know, that they are, that that plane in which they are near and dear once have boarded now uh, flies off with them. And one wants to witness that, you know, that's a very good example of uh, empathic witnessing of other, the relational other, you know, the relational other flies off with an airplane, you know. And when the relational other flies off with an aeroplane, we give a shy of relief, a deep shy of satisfaction. But it's not uh, a kind of satisfaction that gives you uh, a sense of a sense of possession. But 
a sense of uh, a sense of satisfaction by way of detaching yourself from your near and dear ones who had flown off uh, maybe to another continent and by visiting uh, that moment of uh, his or her being flown off and by by seeing it from a distant visitors gallery maybe with a binocular you know where you enhance your capacity to vision to exactly see when the flight is flying off you know with your near and dear ones you know uh, it's like seeing how another how another is getting embedded you know in a different domain in a, in a different uh, sky or in a different continent you know uh, which is uh, something very strange and new to uh, that person you know but you enjoy you you have an enjoyment here because you see her flying off in an aeroplane you know she's not really thrown into the other continent but she is flying off into another continent by her own choice as well as your choice of making her board into that flight you know uh, so 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 you can see here a very complex transition that is happening to your being at one level at one level your being is separating itself uh, from uh, the being uh, with the other you know the being with the other has flown off so you separate yourself from the being with the other and the moment you separate yourself from the being with the other you know you get a kind of a new simulated sense of satisfaction a simulated sense of satisfaction that the other has boarded and the flight has flown off you know and at the same time you have a shy why the shy the shy of separation that your near and dear ones have left you and have gone to another domain you know although you will now get reconnected you will re-territorialize yourself by reconnecting you know once this other gentleman or other person uh, lands in a certain new land you will reconnect you know yourself you know you are waiting for that reconnection uh, but at the same time there's a shy of separation shy of pain or pang or mourning a sense of mourning so so what is happening here simultaneously you know there's a kind of a pleasurable violence there's a liminal sense of separation and also a kind of a liminal which is not within your control expectation that the well-being of the other is ensured though the other has separated herself from you uh, by leaving a lot of memory by which you have pain and a shy of separation in you you know so so there's a kind of an observation of how another is going to a new embedded world of objects as a kind of a stranger or placing herself or himself before that strange world to which uh, the other is not familiar with or the situation to which the other is not familiar with so so that's a kind of a, a kind of a context in which uh, the extended being you know is separated from the being with which you held yourself the being which is held on to yourself or being which is being reserved as heidegger would say the being reserved and the extended being are separated from each other and that moment of separation of extended being and the being at reserve uh, is a moment of observing that the being is afflicted observing that the being is affected this affliction and this affectation of separation uh, is a mode of violence it's a kind of hyperactivity you know in which one is engaged into one is engaged into thinking about the other but at the same time the other is not there so that's a kind of a uh, kind of an that's a kind of an ascendance ascendance into a situation in which one is not actually connected to the other but one is waiting for a certain kind of a reconnection you know by separating oneself from the other it's a kind of an hyperactivity which is happening at a liminal uh, point of contact at a liminal point of no contact you can say or a liminal point of contact is a kind of a psycho uh, analytical um, disparagement a psychoanalytical restructuring that is happening of the uh, relationship of the connection that one has with the other and and this is a kind of a uh, mimic uh, form of violence as if the separation is violent though it is not violent at this point of time because one is able to see where one is going by using a GPS, by using certain other uh, internet tools. 
one is able to continually see where the other is going and one is in touch but by a kind of a mediated medium you know a kind of a technological mediation is making it possible to remain connected though they are separated but technologically mediated connection is replacing the very sense of separation but can it actually replace the very sense of separation it cannot replace the very sense of separation because separation provokes a certain kind of a jilted jilted sense of being aggrieved jilted sense of being uh, a kind of a longing or a kind of a uh, or a kind of a grief or a kind of uh, some kind of a uh, uh, unbearable you know sense of uh, what the uh, feeling is all about you know uh, it's a kind of a sense of liminality that cannot be exactly expressed in language but that will remain you know as part of the being uh, and and the extended being has created that kind of a sense of being which is not part of the being but it has got infused into the being at this point of time as a kind of a liminal sense of being and that liminal being and the extended being are in a kind of an antagonism they are not exactly in a kind of a harmony with each other though the technological connection would like to create that kind of an harmony but can technology bridge this gap between one self and another between being and being with another is the question and heidegger says no it cannot bridge up because what we think as bridged up is nothing but a loss of the worldhood and bull chun uh, han would say that this is a very loss of the self the loss of the desire and add something like a kind of a desubjectified form desubjectivated form of experiencing a separation as a kind of violence and and this is sort of mimicked this is mimicked by our technological devices this sense of separation this sense of having a kind of a non relationality between oneself and oneself because of separation with the other one is affected one is affected because of a separation with the other and this is mimicked in our generative ai as this generative ai through its filtered layers of communication encodes a message of separation in a manner that this message is shared between uh, those who are separated you know, that message is shared if that message of separation is shared between those who are separated you know what happens is that separation becomes now a reality separation becomes now uh, something that is testified something that is certified so you have a certified validated authenticated sense of separation instead of bridging up technology creates that kind of an effect and bull chung han would say that this is a kind of a repressive effect it's a kind of a repression that we are carrying out on ourselves uh, as if you know it's something that is reverse engineered by technology you know and technology carries that message of separation that message of grief that message of being uh, alienated or being stranger to oneself you know through its channels of communication with the other you know who is uh, uh, who is not part of your desire but at the same time part of a channel of communication who, who can read you by sitting at a distance that uh, my friend or not my friend in united states now at this moment can read me that i am thinking about separation through the channels of communication by hearing me or by transcribing all that i am saying to all of you so this is what generative ai is creating instead of creating a bridge you know it is creating uh, a certain uh, consolidation or a validation or solidification of this moment of separation between one self and another you know and this is something liminal it's a sign of a borderline compulsive disorder as a uh, bull chung han would say and this is very close to what uh, jill delius you know would say that uh, it's a kind of a uh, schizophrenia though delius schizophrenia you know would be talking about new ways of uh, reconstituting uh, the connection between the mind and the body uh, here technological simulation separates the mind and the body it doesn't allow you a re-territorialization of mind 
your mind in your body, but it may re-territorialize your mind into some other bodies on a virtual platform. It may even decontextualize your bodily identity into something desubjectivated, in which you look a stranger to yourself, you look another to yourself, you know. Uh, so, so it's a kind of a schizophrenic moment, you know. And Bung Chul Han would quote uh, Deleuze and Guattari to discuss about this desubjectivated moment of schizophrenia. Now, what is the implication of all this? The implication of all this is that, you know, we are now attached to certain technological gadgets. For example, the smartphone that you wield, what does that smartphone do? That smartphone continually creates and recreates all the images of you and it transmits it as data to a large network. And we are not able to disconnect ourselves or separate ourselves from that kind of a gadget and thereby happily surrendering ourselves to a larger surveillance mechanism. And, and using these gadgets, we are able to access to a large number of data, a data that is not actually our need, but an artificial kind of need is created of this kind of data by artificial networks, you know, to which we are all wedded to, and thereby subjecting ourselves or our, our own being to a certain kind of surveillance happily, as if this is our uh, this is our free will, this is our freedom to choose that we have become part of a larger network of surveillance in which we are surveilled and in turn we are surveilling others as well because each one of us are in a process of surveillance surveilling each other in a reciprocal way what Michel Foucault talked about a kind of a panopticon a panopticon in which the body is subjected here the self the being and the identity is subjected by a kind of a reciprocal you know, subjection, uh, by a kind of a continuous interconnected surveillance of each one by the other, you know. And it's a kind of a literal surveillance uh, that is happening. And Bull Chung Han uh, considers this kind of a literal surveillance as a kind of a psychopolitical process by which the mind is manipulated. It's uh, not even biopolitical of the Agambanian kind where body is subjected by the sovereign in the full visibility of everyone else. And then the body is relegated to the bare body, you know, uh, the kind of Agambanian kind of state of exception and biopolitics that Foucault and Agamben talks about, as opposed to which Bull Chung Han talks about uh, a kind of a psychopolitical process where mind is subjugated and it's no longer the visible subjugation of the body. Once mind is subjugated, everybody can be subjugated as part of the freedom that kind of subjugation brings us. And paradoxically, that freedom leads us to an ironical situation of subjecting each other into a process of surveillance. You know. And that's a kind of a paradoxical situation in which um, uh, Bull, Hun, Bull, uh, Bull Chung Han would argue that the typical social differentiation or differential markers like class, race, society, etc., are sort of blurred. And this blurring function of uh, this kind of a uh, surveillance is something that, uh, that actually subjects one uh, to a different process of uh, becoming a desubjectivated subject. And this desubjectivated subject is now uh, presented with you know, a certain kind of choice. So what kind of choice uh, this desubjectivated panopticon subject is, is presented with? And that is something we need to talk about. Uh, the the desubjective, desubjectivated subject is now uh, presented with something that is like an unrealized, you know, something that, that is like an unrealized effective component, you know, of our being, of our memory, of our dream of our self, of our identity, you know, something that is an unrealized effective set of elements. You cannot really realize your being, identity, etc. after being externalized in a larger simulated platform that you can bring them back to your own, uh, own self or to your own soul or to your own body. So, so it's something uh, that, is, uh, uh, that is unrealizable. But at the same time, 
it is already realized as an effect on your body or on your mind that your extended self has created and gone into that larger network of new objects. You know. uh, so, and but it is not uh, redirectable at you, reorientable towards you. Uh, there is no reverse communication from once it is being transported in that simulated world as an extended part of the being. The communication or the kind of identification that it had had broken down. And this is something that um, that can be called in the language of um, uh, let me let me take these other two philosophers in the language of Simon Robel, you know, Simon Robel, you know, would call it the transfer of the greatest anomalies. He would call it as the transfer of the greatest anomalies. And these anomalies are something uh, which are part of our post digital you know, kind of existence, whether post digital human can exist. Among this kind of anomalies, why it is post digital? Because uh, we have gone extended, an extended being has taken us over. We have gone extended, and that extended being that has taken us over, you know, which is not embodied in us, and also it is not something that is disembodied because we are not able to disembody ourselves from that kind of an extended being. But that at the same time, we are desubjectivated and we are trying to re territorialize ourselves through that simulated connection that we have with our extended being, you know, and thereby uh, breaking down this uh, relationship or relationality that our being has with being with by being with another or by being in the world, you know, this relationality that we have in the world or with another. You know, is now broken down into something that is ready to hand, you know, something that we are ready to hand over immediately as a kind of a product or as a kind of a response you know, uh, is, is, is the greatest anomaly, you know, that, uh, that uh, Simon talks about, Simon Robel talks about, uh, is, a, is the kind of the greatest anomaly uh, that can happen on us. And this anomaly needs to be uh, theorized. It needs to be presented in a certain vein. And uh, Simon Robel's uh, kind of work that I wanted to mention here, you know, uh, 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 is, a, is a kind of a work that he calls deferring the self, you know. Uh, yeah. and, and you can defer yourself, you know, into uh, something like a deferred self. And that deferred self is not something uh, that, is, uh, that is a kind of a sovereign self anymore. It's a, it's a non-sovereign kind of a self, you know. And uh, this, uh, this uh, famous book that he has written, which is called Regimes of Capital in the Post-Digital Age, where he discusses how self is deferred into uh, something that is post-digital. Post-digital in the sense that uh, the digitized self, you know, uh, is only an avatar. And this avatar is something that is post-digital, something like, a kind of a reincarnation and this uh, reincarnation is something that is graded you know it is not something which is uh, uh, always instituted you know but it can be all the time instituted and reinstituted it's not already instituted but it can be reinstituted all the time let's say uh, the notion of a vaccinated self that uh, simon discusses you know in terms of the role of vaccination after uh, post-COVID or post-COVID time, a vaccinated self, you know, is uh, is uh, is, a, is a kind of information, is a kind of a data that is available in a digital uh, platform, and that is your post-digital self, which is vaccinated. Now, this vaccinated post-digital self, you know, uh, again, uh, Simon would point out, you know, uh, is a kind of either digital continuity. You digitally continue even after your bodily death or the post-digital self, you know, uh, that lives in a kind of a non-digital self in a, in a flesh, let's say, in a phenomenological flesh where it lives, you know. It continues to live or it continues to die. Uh, it, it continues to die or it died, but the post-digital self of it is continuing in a digital environment, you know. So, so, uh, so it's a kind of a institution you know that uh, is created by digital environment and this kind of an institution actually creates uh, a certain kind of an immorality you know 
uh, Simon would say, it's a kind of an immorality, digital immorality, as he named said. So digital immorality marks the post-digital self. Uh, 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 this is what uh, Simon would talk about. And uh, the implication of such a post-digital post self is that, you know, you have to look at its implication in, in social terms. And the implication of the uh, post-digital self is that um, you cannot simply identify, you know, certain organisms or certain processes as beneficial to your non-digital self. You know. The non-digital will now be totally determined by the post-digital. You will have a conception of past or future based on what the post-digital self, you know, can be attributed to. What this post-digital self can create for you, that will be determining your uh, real self. And your real self can no longer be taken out of itself to connect it to the post-digital self once such a post-digital self is created. And this situation is something like the greatest anomaly that one can think about. What can be the nature of cooperation in this kind of a post-digital self? This is a question that, uh, that emanates here. And uh, Robel would say that we can better understand, you know, the reasons for this kind of digital immortality through the analysis of practices and institutions, uh, such as the, the practice of vaccine, vaccination, you know, uh, and uh, it will have a legal coding. A vaccinated person will carry a legal code and a non-vaccinated person cannot carry that legal code. And a vaccinated, legally coded person who is digitally available to another person to be inspected for a certain purpose on a certain window, you know, is having a post-digital life, which is not connected to the non-digital life of that person. And, and this is something like a strange kind of continuity, which is, uh, once again, you know, a certain kind of a mimicking of the non-digital into the post-digital. The non-digital is now simulated into something that is post-digital, you know, after vaccination or after a certain kind of a treatment that one has undergone and the data is stored in the form of a certain set of informations and which can explain the reasons for a certain kind of a choice or a certain kind of a performance or certain operation, maybe a surgery that one has undertaken, you know. So the post-digital self becomes uh, not just a complement or a supplement, but post-digital self becomes something that is extended, something that is stretched out of the non-digital self, in terms of which the non-digital self, the self in the flesh, can now be uh, understood. Jill Deleuze once again, you know, talk, talked about a certain kind of a sympto symptomatology. A kind of a post-digital self is a kind of a symptom of the kind of schizophrenic, liminal, non-digital self engaged with its extended being, you know, uh, gives rise to in the form of desiring without uh, a concrete object of desire, you know, uh, in, in the sense of desubjectivation or in the sense of deterritorialization, uh, waiting to be re-territorialized with a kind of a technological bridging which actually is an act of separation or a disruption, as we have discussed. So you can imagine what is happening in the digital world at this point of time. If we look at it at the micro level, we can uh, sublimate this experience of disruption into an experience of need or pleasure. But this is not an experience of need or pleasure, but it's just a process of sublimating the non-digital by the post-digital, uh, Simon Robel would argue. Now, what is the implication of this uh, kind of a uh, post-digital, you know, self? Uh, looked at from uh, a, a kind of a uh, artificial AI uh, point of view, the post-digital sense, post-digital self, uh, is only virtually present. You know, you can see it is present everywhere. It is universally telepresent. A word that. Uh, uh, Maga, Ma Maggie has used, you know, uh, she has used this word in the sense of describing uh, the, the nature of post-digital self, you know, Maggie Savin Baden has described this uh, post-digital self as something that is uh, universally telepresent, you know, 
and it is uh, a kind of an artificial telepresence. And this artificial telepresence, you know, uh, uh, is, uh, is something that is integrated into the agency of the user who is making use of this universally telepresent self, universally telepresent post-digital self in the form of data. The user of this data is acquiring agency by making use of this post-digital self and the data about it in a certain simulated platform. You know, and, and this is something in which uh, uh, a certain kind of a technological and evolutionary progress is happening. The so-called technological evolutionary progress in the form of availability of data before the user, through which the user is acquiring a certain agency at the cost of losing the agency of the other, you know, uh, is something, once again, is a kind of an anomaly. It's an anomaly that the user has the agency, you know, and that which is used is only a tool, is only an object without any uh, subjective status, you know, except that the user knows subjectively that, you know, he or she is making use of certain data without connect, being connected to the flesh and blood of that data. Uh, the flesh and blood is totally turned into a universal telepresence without need of any real flesh and blood presence, you know. And that is something uh, that cuts us off from um, uh, a kind of a uh, real flesh and blood presence at this point of time. And this is a great uh, uh, kind of a implication for our understanding of uh, uh, humanness, whether uh, a kind of robotic humanness or robotic humanness uh, can be created out of this kind of telepresence or telepresence would create a kind of a hunter-gatherer kind of relationship or uh, humanity uh, would be uh, would be sort of uh, sharply attenuated sharply uh, counted down uh, to a kind of uh, uh, to a kind of absurd telepresence you know which is uh, uh, which is not available at hand but which is only available as a kind of a data you know uh, and this is something uh, that really needs to be further investigated uh, because uh, it is something a disembodied form of machination whether this disembodied form of machination allows us you know uh, to uh, talk about uh, our friends uh, to be in a fraternity to reconnect us to the larger human world uh, and regain the worldhood that we have lost uh, is the question. And uh, Maggie Seven Badin is not at all optimistic. He's saying that this is a loss of uh, our potential to be human. And this uh, loss of potential to be human is part of our desire, a larger desire to be part of the uh, telepresent world. So therefore, we are caught into that kind of a paradox of which we are not able to move out. I think uh, this is all that uh, I wanted to say, and uh, we can have discussion on that. Uh, thank you all once again. Yeah. I can see Piyabut has joined me from Thailand. Uh, Piyabut, you are welcome, Dr. Piyabut, who teaches at uh, Chiang Mai University. You know, he's there. Piyabut, can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Okay. Dr. Koshi, please. Sure. Yeah. Thank you nice so much. Yeah, it was a very insightful presentation. I think now Aditi will uh, proceed further. Yeah, sure. Yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you so much. It was it was a talk with uh, uh, really brimming with novel insights and of course the expertise that we expected. My head is like in a whirlwind of thoughts, as I'm sure is the case with many of us here. So without further ado. I invite Arovi to moderate the question and answer and discussion sessions. Over to you, Arovi. Thank you, Aditi. Uh, participants may note that they can choose to either address their questions and comments directly to the speaker by using the hand raise option at the bottom of the screen. Or alternatively, you can also choose to type your questions in the chat box for us to read it out on behalf. The floor is now open for discussion. So. Um, thank you, Professor Prasenjit, for the talk. Like, I have a very basic question. So, uh, 
when 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 you spoke of uh, you know uh, biomutual harm um, the self and the extended self and the kind of uh, violence that one inflicts on oneself that is the extended self inflicting it upon the self that they have understood it correctly does uh, biomutual harm also uh, like um, is it bill uh, biomutual harm's concern to uh, you know delineate an ontological kind of status to the body as to what it means to be human which is devoid of any sort of extension that uh, you know we take on through technological practices or interventions um, because um, i have read a little bit of post phenomenological thinkers and their arguments would be that we have never been uh, you know without a technological mediation or intervention that uh, you know to be directed towards the world is always already to be directed uh, um through um a mediation of technology or you know be it uh, uh, any kind of technology rudimentary or you know very high tech or whatever um so is biomutual harm making an ontological distinction here that you know once you take on something it is never possible to go back to that uh, uh, kind of a uh, um, self which is pure or uh, you know i don't know if that made any sense so, to be his question yeah i have as i've understood uh, the question is uh, whether you know bul chung han is talking about a kind of an ontologically um, uh, given human uh, body which is without any extension and if it is uh, he's talking about something like this whether that kind of a self can be free from violence uh, this is what um, probably uh, aruvi is asking i'm sort of uh, paraphrasing it in my own way okay aruby so the point here is that um, we talk about humanity in a in a variety of senses you know bung hul uh, bung chung han is talking about um, uh, a variety of functions of the self let's say uh, self as it is um, in a kind of a capitalist setup where it's an inter entrepreneurial self an entrepreneurial self you know would like to sort of give up you know on his flesh and blood self and would like to become part of a telepresence you know so that the telepresence self now can negotiate you know the kind of products and the kind of um, uh, desired uh, output that it can produce and put in the uh, circuit of circulation uh, so so it's a kind of a uh, process of generation of capital and a process of generation of surplus or surplus value that would completely alter the nature of the self and to turn it into uh, a self which is available digitally in the form of data and between the earlier self and this datafied self you know there is a huge um, kind of an area you know which again is technologically mediated but this technologically mediated gap between uh, the the flesh the flesh and blood self and the digitized self is something that uh, is not easily achievable because it is filled with a lot of violence is filled with a lot of disruptions it's filled with a, a sense of losing one's own self you know uh, but at the same time one is pleased to see that one is losing one's self in order to get a digitized uh, kind of identity uh, so so this is something uh, that uh, a kind of self is created by capitalist market that um, uh, boom uh that boom talks about han talks about and han is saying that uh, desiring this kind of self is part of an idea of positivity is part of an idea of achievement to the extent that whatever one doesn't have one desires it by committing even violence on the other i know and this violence is not a direct physical bodily violence but this violence is to you know see oneself off see the other off itself is an act of violence uh, that's something very very significant argument that uh, bung uh, chung uh, hal is han is giving because uh, according to bung this process of seeing off is actually uh, transporting yourself to a different world of embedded objects you know and you are part of that world the other is also part of the world, part of that world and both have lost their self identity so how do you rediscover your humanness remains a big problem in the post digital world okay aruvi this is a kind of a larger explanation yeah thank you professor
professor koshi you may uh... yeah thanks Ajay. thanks professor as usual uh, you know very erudite and uh, very interesting presentation I was just wondering, I mean, uh, somewhere uh, as you were uh, making this presentation, particularly with regard to uh, the point that uh, Byung Chul Han was raising, you know, uh, where uh, there is also an inability to desiring for the other, you know. Uh, but uh, keeping the allegory of the rosary in mind, I was just wondering if we could, uh, you know, treat uh, these devices, you know, like a rosary, perhaps is there not a scope for uh, you know, desiring for the other in the sense, at least uh, petitioning uh, on behalf of the other, you know, a sort of praying uh, for the other. Is there any such scope which can, to some extent, alleviate that uh, lack of desiring for the other? Yes, uh, uh, Koshi, I have forgotten to talk about rosary. Rosary is a place of confessing one's own sins, one's own failings, and what uh, one has not actually delivered and for which one holds oneself as guilty and one is trying to you know expiate oneself one is trying to relieve oneself from the burden of the guilt uh, in this context rosary would be relieving oneself from the burden of burden of becoming you know what one has become or what one desires to become and yet you know there is some shortcoming and that uh, gap between becoming and non becoming you know is something that becomes a matter of uh, one's deeper reflection in the psyche. And that uh, reflective psyche is manipulated in the sense of creating a bigger desire because uh, that reflective psyche is now captured in a certain platform that uh, what an individual can desire if one is offered with this kind of a scheme or this kind of an exemption or this kind of a lucrative offer what a desiring psyche can think about that thinking of a new desire and the kind of lacuna that one has suffered in desiring to become something you know which is already there embedded you know they are also like uh, uh, some kind of a hyper object embedded in one's mind and these hyper objects are connected uh, by some invisible uh, mental connection within one's mind and which could be simulated at the larger level of the society in terms of the desirability of something, its achievement and the consequent becoming or not becoming, you know, making the entire psychic process uh, opened out in the form of an open uh, simulated uh, platform of looking at each other reciprocally by uh, by way of surveilling through certain gadgets by way of spying if dropping by way of reading each other's mind you know which is uh, nothing but a kind of violence because the sanctity of the uh, bodily identity the sanctity of the self is now opened out into uh, something like a large sphere in which uh, one has become totally open to the other to the extent that uh, the very very privacy of one's own consciousness, one's own self has been totally lost out. And in the process, you know, the conscious sense of the world is also lost out. A sense of loss of the worldhood also has been generated in the process. So this is precisely what generative AI is doing. The symbols with which we manipulate in the initial stage goes through a certain layer and becomes something totally different, uh, so different that uh, even even this auto learning programs are not able to understand how different they are uh, and this is how genetic manipulation happens this is how manipulation of information can happen uh, in the information pathway by uh, generative ai you know so you have to put an adversarial ai to capture from your side to protect your own forte uh, but that's not happening and it's an entirely a complex neural process that that in, involves liminal psychic states all the time which is altering and fluctuating within oneself you know and this is the situation in which uh, one is losing oneself and is not able to love the other you know this is what uh, bull chung han was pointing out in his book called typologies of violence yeah <laughs> thank you thank you for that uh, ravindra ji had raised his hand. Sure. yeah 
गुड आफ्टरनून सर गुड आफ्टरनून रविंद्र यस सर मीन्स इन जनरल टर्म्स वी वी रिकॉग्नाइज रोजरी एज अ इंस्ट्रूमेंट बाय विच वी डू सम प्रैक्टिस ऑफ रिपीटेशन ऑफ नेम होली नेम एनी रिलीजन राइट हाँ सो इन दैट टर्म लाइक डिजिटल इन डिजिटल वर्ल्ड वी कीप ऑन स्क्रोलिंग सो इन इन जनरल टर्म इन विच that that also we we delude ourselves we, we get to the other some other kind of self yes yes you are on the right course i must say rabindra because in the digital world the whole world digital world is a rosary you know and you are trying to create and recreate objects of desire uh, and that's not just confessing about oneself what one desires but is moving much beyond uh, the the limited sphere of confession the relationality with god because you are getting related to a larger simulated world a world full with designs full with uh, fabricated objects even filled with a certain kind of a uh, certain kind of a dream a certain kind of a show uh, a certain kind of a flash a flash a flash of light you know uh, colorful lights in which uh, redesigning all kinds of objects are happening so so you have moved away from the actual rosary and entered into a rosary which takes you to a world of embedded objects uh, so so there is a transition that has already happened which you are not able to recognize how you have transited yourself to that uh, kind of a rosary where your confessions have turned into uh, new objects of desire you know uh, and this is something where you have crossed the path and the limits of your own self you know you have crossed the a uh, linguistic imagination of the world in a sense you have lost your worldhood and entered into an embedded set of new world you know okay ravindra ha huh, sir ha huh. yes sir so but that world that digital world is all commercialized sir and advertisement yeah. as it is a capital world sure so that is yes yes so how it is commercial Aggressive you were standing before a menu behavior yeah sure you were standing before a menu you know in an airport your very act of standing is commercialized because it is recorded as a data that you want this kind of a dosa or this kind of a uh, sausage it's recorded you know in a certain digital platform and you are, your choice has been turned into a data and that data you know gives the money uh, to the fellow who has datafied it you know so therefore without your knowledge you have been datafied and you have contributed to the surplus value without even labor uh by standing out of your pleasure before the mcdonald you know menu board you have turned into data and you have given money to the mcdonald okay ravindra this is how this transportation has happened ha sir yes yes uh, thank you thank you sir thank you welcome um just a curious sure. rejoinder if i may uh, so when we were speaking about this datafication of the self just speculating here uh, so what happens what can possibly happen when you know there is you know and there is a destruction of this data does the self come back to itself yes uh no self can never come back to the self you know the self with which you have started you know with which uh, you have entered into that world you can never return to that entry point whether that entry point can be re-simulated yes it can be re-simulated Uh, in a kind of a representation in a kind of a story or in a kind of an image but that image is not something that holds you you hold on to the image like your rear view window uh, of the of the car uh, so so therefore uh, it's not possible to re-enter into the world with your uh, kind of self with which you have made your original starting point you cannot return to the initial conditions of your consciousness once you have entered into that world okay arubhi thank you professor just a, a, a you know sure. <laughs> random thought i mean i was just yeah, uh, thinking please. about that uh, expression which was quite uh, powerful when you made this uh, remark that uh, the extended self is not something which we own no it escapes us uh, I, i was just thinking contrast it with the phenomenological you know notion of the body extended body which man love bondi and all talk about where we still do have a kind of you know possession and ownership of body but when it comes to an extended self 
absolutely i mean uh, there is a kind of inability for us to you know uh, control it or own it so that's that's quite uh, and striking, and, it, striking yes. and, and it's so it makes us socially disabled you know right, right. we are socially disabled here right, right. and not just individually disabled right. and that's a complete reversal of the social process by which we have our lived experience right. here our lived experience is very different yes. of being decontextualized right. and desubjectivated all the time exactly exactly I mean, that, that's that's the philosophical you know uh, import of it because you know we at least the early uh, phenomenal generation phenomenologists thought that by talking about an embodied self they could uh, you know bring it uh, within the purview of the you know extended body but then this kind of an analysis would show that you no know, we are still getting <laughs> away from that we are really moving out of the concrete out. world out of and world. becoming something absurd or abstract right. Right. or right. something that is abducted out of us yes. you know yes, yes. <laughs> thank you thank you Any other comment, please? Yeah. Um, hello, Tendon, sir. You may yeah, sure. register your comment. Yes. Yes, yes. Dr. Tendon, please. Yeah. You can unmute yourself, Dr. Tendon, and address yourself. Uh, Alokji, you need to unmute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much for this enlightening talk. Because I was not aware of such developments in philosophy of technology. Right. So I cannot comment on that. But what I feel that was the situation very much different uh, from this post digital uh, to pre digital. And where do we go from here? From this post digital scenario, which you have given us, it seems to be very, very much pessimistic. So is there any any uh, way of uh, getting or recovering our humanness possible? This is the question. Yes, yes. I also ended up with this question, Dr. Tendon, how to recover humanness in such a situation. I mean, my own thought is that uh, we need to deconstruct this post-digital self as well. And that will require deconstruction of generative AI, you know, but now that we are making use of large language models. Uh, and when you ask me such a question, I'm not uh, trying to think uh, for the future, but suppose I'm making use of chat GPT and putting your question in chat GPT and chat GPT is giving me an answer saying that, well, your post digital self will lead you the way. And that is the way, you know, the way post-digital self leads you the way. Chat GPT may give me this answer. And this answer will become part of my digital epistemology. So we have to get back to the question of to what extent such a post-digital self ensures, you know, the basic issues of um, uh, distribution, the basic issues of social good and the public good. Can we turn post-digital selves into public good? To what extent these post-digital selves that are present, you know, in terms of uh, teaching in the virtual mode or in terms of uh, giving us a choice and enlightening us about which product we should buy or which medicine we should consume in order to save ourselves from, let's say, high blood pressure or something like that, you know, uh, whether that serves our purpose and to what extent it can be uh, something that ensures largest good of the largest. You know, we should subject the post-digital self to certain ethical questions. Whether this post-digital genetic manipulation by which we are creating new biological products or we are thinking about a new kind of biological evolution of our brain, you know, in which our brains are interconnected and I can learn everything from your brain and you can learn everything from my brain, which is part of a new discourse about evolution, whether that's going to enlighten us to the extent that, you know, we are able to solve much of the problems, uh, let's say mathematical problem and human problems. So rediscovering humanness in such a situation will become circumstantial. It will again require a kind of reflective exercise uh, of which we are deprived of, because my electronic avatar cannot have 
that kind of a reflective ability. My electronic avatar can borrow an idea from auto-generated AI or self-learning AI. Now, this self-learning AI can give me certain new ideas, but I have to uh, shuffle through these ideas and I have to look at uh, a situation of the world in which I am embedded, which the post-digital self is not enabling me to look at. It is rather creating a blindfold for me. So these are some of the problems that we need to deconstruct and subject them to ethical uh, questioning so that we can rediscover our humanness in the post-digital world. Dr. Tendon, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. There is still a hope. <laughs> sure. Sure. Um, so since we are running out of, uh, running a little late, we may have to end the Q&A session now. Participants whose questions are not answered, uh, may please uh, write to Professor Prasenjit. Uh, his email ID is being shared in the chat box. Thank you so much, Professor, for engaging in the Q&A session. Over to you, Aditi. Thank you, Aravi. Now I invite uh, Professor Elizabeth for a formal vote of thanks. Good evening to all. On behalf of SSPIS, I would like to extend my gratitude to Professor Prasenjit Biswas for such an intriguing lecture. Thank you, sir. It was very interesting. I would also like to thank Professor Koshi Tharakan, Dean of SSPIS, for his constant support and encouragement. I also thank all faculty members of the school for their support towards the program. A big thanks also goes out to all research scholars, students at SSPIS, all participants from and outside Goa University and abroad, also to all those who helped with the event promotion. Thank you. Over to you, Aditi. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, the recording of this lecture will be available on uh, philosophy of uh, on our YouTube channel at uh, Goa, philosophy at Goa University, um, and uh, just we will be back soon with another lecture. Stay tuned with us. Uh, keep the support going. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining, and I declare this program as over. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, sir. Thank Koshi, you. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye bye. Special, uh, special thanks from uh, okay. my side. I thank, I thank all the students, especially, for holding such a big, big session every time. Thank you all. Bye bye. bye. bye.